to start? Is this really a story that I want to learn about in more detail? The time that my grandmother spent in Bergen-Belsen. I've been hearing these stories ever since I was a little girl, but everyone in the family has a different version of it. So it's hard to tell what's real and what has changed over time. And as time goes by, the details are forgotten, and that memory gets fuzzier. Memory is not a folder that you download. Memory is a recreation. Every time that you remember something, you remember it differently. A hundred people that have lived one event remember it in a hundred different ways. If I have kids one day, what story am I going to tell them? And what if I got it wrong? It'd be really upsetting if I got it wrong. How the story of the Holocaust is told is important. There are consequences to misrepresenting history, and I don't want my students to leave the classroom thinking that the Holocaust is just another static time in history. The challenge is making it relevant to them. So I decided that the only way I could really know what happened to my grandmother is to go there, to, to go to Bergen-Belsen. I needed to find out for myself. I mean, I live in this great multicultural city. But the fact remains is that if she hadn't survived the Holocaust, if she hadn't been liberated from Bergen-Belsen, I wouldn't be here. When it comes to memory, one of the, the main questions we ask is, how is this event remembered? Not just commemorated. What is Holocaust memory two generations later? How does it translate into my understanding of family? How does it translate into how I view the world? I could see myself living here. The town has really cool artwork and everyone's really friendly. But then, 20 minutes down the road, I, you know, my family was murdered. And then you have to wonder, do the kids living here today have any idea about what happened? Robin. I'm Habe. Nice to Good meet you. Good to see you. you. Thank you for seeing me. Thanks for coming. My name is Habe Knoch and I'm director of the Bergen-Belsen Memorial Site. It's an exhibition which brings to a site of anonymous mass death the stories of those people who died and suffered here. You know when you were growing up you'd, you'd hear these stories about the camp and Belson, and it kind of, it's like this big monster that's sort of, you know, these terrible, terrible stories. And you come here and there's nothing. So it's very hard to imagine where everything had been. It is a cemetery for tens of thousands of people. You can see the mass graves. You don't see anything else, no buildings. Only a few uh, foundations, only a few artifacts on or from the ground. I would suggest that we get inside and I give you some information about the topography because we have a photo there from 1944. My grandmother, Sala, uh, she was born in Benjin, Poland. Uh, she was one of six children. When the Nazis came to Poland, they forced the Jews into these these overcrowded ghettos. After about three weeks or so in the ghettos, they started to deport the people to the labor camps. And if you had any form of skill at all, maybe you could survive. So my grandmother had heard through the line that they were looking for people who knew how to sew. So she told a Nazi officer, I know how to sew. And they sent her and her sister Masha to the labor camps and she did not know how to sew. A 
but somehow she was able to steal a soldier's uniform and she took it apart and she learned how it was made and that's how she learned how to sew and it saved their lives. And the rest of her family, they were sent to the death camps. After that, my grandmother and her sister Masha were sent to several concentration camps. They were in um, Neugame, they were in Ravensbrück and Sachsenhausen. And then as the war came to an end, the Nazis put them on the death march to Bergen-Belsen. It was late 44. And then we marched for days on end. A uh, lot of people on the road that just fell to the side and were shot, left. But at the final stages, must have been December of 44, we wound up on a, on a train, you know, a cattle wagon, was transported right up to the ramp, which is a kilometer or so, and marched into Bergen-Belsen. When we get to the gate over there, we saw from far away, oh, I think there's cabbage, bunch of cabbage, we thought it was cabbage. There were dead bodies, piles, piles, they were already green. They could not bury them anymore. The crematorium did not work anymore. We had no clothes. Everything was dirty, everything was, I mean, ugh. At that point, people were really so sick. Mm -hmm. Dysenteria, typhoid. There was not enough food in Auschwitz, in, in Bergen-Belsen. There was, I don't remember at all uh, a shower in Bergen-Belsen. I saw people dying around me everywhere of hunger, of illness. Right across from us with a charnel house filled with corpses not just the inside, but overflowing all over. There were corpses all over. I lived, walked beside that people. And after a while, it, it just got to be so that one noticed and one had to say to oneself, I'm not going to see who it is. I'm not going to recognize anyone in this person. You have to take one main perspective and uh, our decision was to use mainly the perspective of the victims and the means for this were our interviews. The approach to, to, to this history is only appropriate when you t uh, talk about it in concrete terms. Not so much generalizing but telling concrete stories and uh, the interviews do tell these concrete stories. My, my father was practically have that for the last week, three nights before the liberation. He says, this is the end of Hitler. Stay alive. And in the morning he was gone. But I remember after they dragged my father out to a pit, it was a big ditch. They threw all the Bodies in, that's where my father wound up. Testimony is a genre of its own. That produces, we have found, a multidimensional kind of document. But it has the living voice and the living image behind it. And that is very different from having a sheet of paper. What you have is also a restitution to the survivor of the survivor's image and freedom of speech. And at 17, you're not afraid of dying, but it was the pain of the regret of not having lived. And I promised myself, if I'll ever have the chance to experience the act of living, I will live it to the fullest. My grandmother never spoke on camera. When she would talk to us, it was, she would only do it when she felt the need to talk to us. And when she would, it was like the story was already playing out, so you would come in in the middle of a story. She would tell us about giving her urine to people to drink because there wasn't any water, or 
um, the time that she urinated on a cloth to alleviate a woman's chest congestion. And there were numerous stories about stealing bread. It wasn't until I read Hannah Levy Haas's book, uh, The Diary of Bergen Belson, that I had any sort of idea of the environment that my grandmother and her sister came into. Starvation is everywhere. Each of us is nothing more than a shadow. For three days, we haven't seen a piece of bread. We are submerged in an ocean of germs and lice, of mold and stench. In the courtyards, the corpses pile up. They rise higher and higher each day. I am terribly ashamed to have lived through all this. One thing we have here in the archive and in the exhibition is a number of personal diaries. Uh, there are uh, more than 20 diaries uh, kept, and here you can see a, a number of them. A grandmother came in March 1945. Yeah, so beginning, end of February, beginning of March. A couple yeah. of weeks before the camp was liberated, and then she stayed for a couple of weeks afterwards. From stories that my grandmother told, um, even after they survived Neugamme and Ravensbrück and Sachsenhausen and the Death March, it was when they came into Belsen, the disease was so rampant that they immediately both got very, very sick. When my grandmother and Masha came to Bergen-Belsen after the death march, they found their brother Joseph. But he was so sick with typhus that a few days after they found him, he died. And then Masha became very sick, and, uh, and she died three days before the British liberated the camp. Bergen-Belsen became a reception camp for those transports from camps which were dissolved uh, in the army frontier area and especially from Sachsenhausen more than 10,000 prisoners were brought then and came to Bergen-Belsen. It's very difficult, almost impossible to describe that situation. Thirst, hunger, confinement, violence and finally then the situation of dying altogether 85,000 in that uh, final stage. So it developed into a death camp. Suddenly, one morning, all the Germans are gone, and suddenly we see the English marching in. Boy. Was it exciting? <laughs> was very exciting. We knew that was the end of the war. As they were showing it, I right away recognized it's Bergen Belsen. And I see this woman kissing a soldier's hand. And I scream, it's my mother, it's my mother. It was a very natural response for her to grab his hand and be so thankful. Uh, I was lying there. I don't know, two or three days, we were already liberated. And uh, I wasn't aware of nothing. And then I saw two people in uniform asking me, you speak English, you speak English? And so I said, yes, I do speak some English. And they took me out into an ambulance, fed me intervenous, I was cared like you wouldn't believe twice a day a doctor, and there was always an attendant. I am the officer commanding the regiment of Royal Artillery guarding this camp. When we came here, conditions were indescribable. The people had had no food for six days. Up to press, we had buried about 17,000 people. And we expect to, be, to bury about half as much again. Fifth British Corps officers who gave the order to take flamethrowers and burn the barracks. And I could see through the back of the truck, like, uh, they burned them with flamethrowers, and nothing was left. A few chimneys stood, 
with all ashes. And it was a good thing because the typhoid was terrible. Half of the people from the 50,000 died after the liberation. I've seen some of the front loaders pushing bodies in. The, there was, I don't see how there was any other way, and they used some sort of a liquid, I think it was calcium or something, to uh, disinfect the area after they moved the dead. Yeah, and one of them is my father. I don't remember how long it was afterward, it couldn't have been more than a week or so, that uh, Ted said, look, I'm going up to Belson again, you've got to come out there with me. You're Jewish. And I said, well, yes, sir. But I, you know, I wasn't all that anxious. And, uh, and uh, when I went, I really, and to this day, honestly, I, I don't want to be dramatic about this, I really couldn't believe that this kind of thing could be, it, that it could happen. And they, the bodies were all gone. They were buried by then. But there were these mass graves everywhere when you'd see a thousand, you'd see 500, you'd see 1500. And you said, you know, these are all, these are, these were people, these were all people. Masha died three days before the liberation. My grandmother and her friends, she called them her camp sisters, they carried Masha's body and they placed her in the corner of one particular grave because she didn't want her body to be bulldozed into a mass grave with the others and just forgotten. If she survived, she wanted to know where her sister was buried. This is a big part of why I came to Bergen-Belsen, to visit the place where Masha was buried. And we know where she is because a few years ago, my grandmother came here with her sons and she came right to this grave and, and she pointed at it. And this was the place. This is where her sister was buried. In April, May of 1945, at the time of the end of the war, there were millions of displaced persons throughout Germany and Austria. What was left in Germany in the displaced person camp were substantial numbers of Jews who did not want to go back primarily to Poland and some to Hungary where there was nothing and no one left for them to return to. After the British liberated Bergen-Belsen, they created a displaced persons camp, also known as a DP camp, about a mile away from the concentration camp. In fact, in many British and American liberated zones, there were DP camps. But Bergen-Belsen was the largest. More than 12,000 people inhabited this DP camp. The DP camps are a fascinating part of Holocaust history, but unfortunately it doesn't get discussed much in courses. It was almost a rebirth of Jewish culture occurring in these camps. Slowly but surely, this place was, was becoming, you can't say a vibrant city, but there was some vibrancy uh, evolving. Uh, there were streets, there were even some names on the streets. A, a, a newspaper was published. It was done in Yiddish. And they coped by recreating the life they had known before. 
with Jewish schools, Yiddish newspapers, Zionist political activities, yeshivas, sports clubs, cultural activities, a theater, concerts. I was more or less the liaison between the British, the Jewish police, and the Bergen-Belsen committee, the Jewish committee. Bergen-Belsen was a very important place because Jewish life came back. The rebirth occurred because of Bergen-Belsen. To see young people, 16, 17, 18, survivors playing soccer together with a team from the British Army. And if our team won, you can imagine the joy. Or to see the CD theater in Bergen-Belsen. Unbelievable. The creativity that we displayed after the liberation, it's unbelievable. When I think now of all these things, I, do, I, I think to myself, where did we get the courage and the ideas to do all these kind of things? There was a celebration that we went to, and they had, they had um, fashioned a stage uh, and, and an auditorium. The works, you know, it's, it's marvelous what people can do out of nothing. And there was singing, there was a chorus, there was a violinist, there was a pantomime. So that sort of thing got going very, very quickly. This was uh, one important way to uh, develop a sense of tradition and history beyond the individual survival. And I think that's what really mattered in the DP camp period. Bergen-Belsen is not only a story of, of destruction and death and atrocities, it is also a story about the rebirth, which is one of the biggest miracles, the miracle of rebirth. What happened in the five years in Bergen-Belsen in the DP camp, where, where close to 2,000 children were born there. There was a lot of marriages going on, sometimes they reckon about 20 a day, because they were trying to get the life back together, they were getting married, and there was a lot of children born. We wanted very much a family because we lost everything. We lost our parents, we lost our sisters and brothers, we lost the whole families. So we wanted to build a nest to be together and to build a new generation. It was very important because we were very, very lonely, very, very lonely. The birth rate in the DP camps after the war was astonishing. After half a dozen years of the reign of death, life sprouted. We were miracle children. We had no right to be. They had no expectation that we would ever be. The one thing that the Germans did not want was Jewish children. They wanted an end to Jewish life. We were the prime evidence that the Germans had not prevailed. The longer the DP camp, uh, in a way, was in existence, a self-organized civil society then was developed. The British thought that uh, they would uh, kind of concentrate all uh, Jewish survivors in that DP camp. So they had a group of 10 to 12,000 Jews in that DP camp. What they did not foresee was that this was uh, also a very a kind of strong self-organization of many different groups and many of them with a very strong Zionist attitude and the wish uh, to get to a Jewish state. In July 1947, passengers boarded a freight called the Exodus. 
The exodus was going from France to Palestine. The British government had Arab partners, and they could not afford to anger them by letting so many Jews settle in Palestine. So the British boarded the exodus. There was footage shown of this incident all around the world, pictures, film, and this caused public outcry. New days of crisis in Palestine as the British complete an intensive search for weapons at a Jewish settlement at Yagur. Precipitating the recent waves of violence in Palestine was Britain's failure to carry out early recommendations to admit 100,000 homeless European Jews. And the scandal put pressure on the United Nations to partition Palestine and to create a homeland for the Jewish people. Jerusalem bristling with British barbed wire is in a state of armed truce. In the YMCA, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine under Sweden's Dr. Sandstrom opens hearings. One day, a German came over and he says to me, are you interested in a radio receiver from a German U-boat? I, I, brought, I brought the little box to Bergen-Belsen and I hooked it up to do it with the, the electricity. And then I turned with it up. I hear the voice, the uh, voice in the United Nations, the voting for the partition of Palestine. Argentina, Argentina, abstention, France, Yes. Oh, I said, if this is the case, I am going to share it with the people. So we hooked up a big loudspeaker in the main square. Hundreds and hundreds of people were assembling there, listening to the, to the news. Australia, yes. We were sitting in the radio and listening exactly which country voted for Israel and against Israel. The United States, yes. We had a dream. We had a dream to get a peace land to stay because no country wanted us. We didn't have a home. It was a very, very hard time. It was, what will be? What will be? If I hear a song and I like it, I have a very good memory. There was one guy, which I remember his name was Mo Zilberman. He was from Dembitz. And he was a guy who was singing songs. Steve Lawrence was singing this song on Ed Sullivan's show. Who wrote this song? I don't know. Boy, tell me where can I go? There's no place I can see. Where to go, where to go? Every door is closed for me. To the left, to the right. It's the same in every land. There is nowhere to go. Oh, that's me who should know. Won't you please understand? The resolution of the Duck Committee for Palestine was adopted by 33 votes, 13 against, 10 abstentions. On May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion, leader of the Jewish community in Palestine, announced the establishment of the State of Israel. Between 1948 and 1951, nearly 700,000 Jews immigrated to Israel, including more than two-thirds of the Jewish displaced persons in Europe. From Berg and Belsen, about 7,000 people immigrated to Israel. Another 2,000 went to America. 800 arrived in Canada. Smaller numbers traveled to other destinations, such as England, Australia, Sweden, Norway, and France. Now I know where to go, 
what my folk proudly stand Let me go, let me go To the precious promised land No more left, no more right Lift your hands and see the light I am proud, can't you see? For at last I am free No more wandering for me My grandmother was a part of this really interesting time in, in the rebuilding of Jewish life at the DP camp. But surprisingly, she didn't really talk about her time there very much. What we do know is that after a few weeks, she left the DP camp and went to Munich, and she got a job as a nurse's aide. But everyone she knew, all of her camp sisters, they were all at the DP camp. So she would go back once a month uh, to be with them, and she would sew wedding dresses and bras, and, and she would be a part of the life there. She left Munich and went to Paris, and that's where she met my grandfather. They were married in 1949. And in 1950, she became pregnant with my mom. And then towards when she was due, she left Paris on her own and went back to the DP camp to have my mom. Why come back here? on your own to do this. And as best as we can figure, the reason that she did it is because that's where her family was. That's where Masha was buried. And she wanted to be close to her family. So on June 6th, 1950, my mom was born and she was one of the last babies born at the DP Camp Bergen-Belsen before the British closed it down. I can show you something of the huge number of births which have happened in the DP Camp, those who stayed here and got the children and those who came back. That's the official birth certificate and it says um, announcement of birth. The name is Hanna Frade Lustiger, born on June 6th in 1950 in the Pone camp in the hospital. So this is the hospital? This is what we now call Glen Hughes Hospital, built roughly about 1938-39. And you have a lot of a lot of survivors come back? Not really survivors now because they are, they are getting too old. Yeah. But we do get a lot of uh, what they call bells and babies, you know, the ones that were born like... Like my mum. Like your mum. Is there any way to know in which room that she was born in? There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a wing over on the other, uh, other side of the trees. Okay. And that should roughly be the place. Oh, really? Yeah. It's hard to, when you see it in this shape, all the, the broken glass and everything, it's hard to believe that this was a cornerstone in, uh, in the Jews rebuilding their lives. And that should roughly be the place where most probably your mother was born. And then the rooms? And this would have been here. These would have been the birthing rooms. grandmother gave birth to my mom here in the final days of the DP camp when people were still living with the memories of, of that that horrible time before the liberation people talk about the Holocaust and they write books and they make movies but she lived it I can't imagine what it is that my grandmother went through no one will but her you know, her experience is her own. And no book or movie could ever recreate a real picture of what it is that she witnessed. Even my mom, who was born there, has only a small part of the story. 
Uh, there's one photograph with young mothers uh, parading their children in the camp. I, want, I think she wanted to be part of that, kind of a defiance of here I am. She told me she didn't have a name until she gave birth to me. She wasn't a sister anymore. She wasn't a daughter. She wasn't a granddaughter. She was nothing. And it was after I was born that I gave her a name. She was a mother. I don't know how my grandmother processed her memories. I don't know how she came to peace with what happened, or if she ever did. You watch the, the sort of archival newsreels that the, uh, the British took when they liberated the camp, and you see you know, the bodies being bulldozed into the mass graves. She was, she was there. She was living it. You know, she, she was carrying bodies. I, I wouldn't want to revisit that, you know? I, I, would, have, I would have trouble telling, telling my grandchildren about that. If all my grandchildren have ever known is comfort, to have lived through so much suffering and pain and to come out the other side and just be so excited about life and so engaged with people and just a genuinely optimistic and, and happy person. She loved us. She loved her grandkids, all of us, so much. And for us, growing up with her, she was just light. It was nothing but warmth and love. If you ask my mom and her siblings, they might have had a different experience. You know, you probably know that there were two kinds of, of homes that the second generation grew in. Those families that nothing was spoken and the children didn't know anything about what happened to the to the parents, this was one kind of home. And our home was a different kind of home. In our home, we spoke about it. What I think is that maybe the normal house, the normal homes, the normal families are those that were shouting at night, that had nightmares. Maybe the normal house that I grew in is the abnormal. I, did, I grew up in a, like, a very large extended family and all of them are survivors. My parents were uh, troubled. It was very hard on my brother and I because uh, they, you know, we grew up with them having fits and nightmares. Uh, my brother and I were just constantly feeling in terror. Like I, I wanted to make, I was drawing ever since I was a little kid, constantly. All my friends, I've been to some reunions, school reunions, they go, Larry, it's Larry's drawer, you know? I don't know, and all the imagery is like, you know, so dark. People look at my work and they say, did you, you, did you break up with your wife? Are you, you just look suicidal, are you like, you know, like I'm going crazy, that I'm hearing voices, that I'm, I'm, I'm hearing screaming, and, and I'm feeling this burden to tell a story and they're screaming at me to get it out, do it, remember me, you know, the whole thing. And, and I, it's terrifying for me, it was terrifying for me. So I, I just wanted to, to do battle with that, figure out where those voices do have a place in my life, that they don't own me, I'm not a surrogate, you know, I'm not. I don't belong to that, to them, you know? It's like... You know, find myself in it all. And, you know, so I kind of started with doodling. And I just started doodling and... just trying to remember why I like drawing in the first place and just enjoy being that kid again, somehow, and start to knit things back together and process and stuff and 
spend more time alone and, you know, moving on. My father was the parent who actually spoke about the past. My father had his dark side too, but he did his very best not to reveal that to me. You can't live in darkness forever. I remember asking my mother, what, wasn't it awful living in the officer's barracks in Belzen? And she said, no, it was fantastic. <laughs> it was great to live somewhere that was real. We were happy. We were happy to be alive. We were happy to have each other. We were happy to have children. Now, I'm not telling you that my mother didn't have nightmares every night, that she woke up and she was alone and there was no one to help her and she couldn't speak the language. On the other hand, they had life and they lived it and they loved it. Every generation will have to re-educate themselves about the Holocaust. It cannot be the work only of one generation. It is so vast an event with so many implications that it has to be done again and again. There is no such thing as Holocaust memory in the abstract. Everything depends on the cultural context out of which memory comes and to which it returns. So one of the things one needs to look at is who the agents of Holocaust memory are, what media they're employing, what some of the conventions of these media are that help to shape the memory. When I was growing up, I would tell my friends about how my grandmother was liberated from Bergen-Belsen, and they would say, well, which one is that? i go, it's, it's the one that Anne Frank was in. Oh, Anne Frank. It's because everyone knows the diary of Anne Frank. Everyone reads it in high school, which makes sense because when you read it, you're her age, so you can identify with her emotions. But what a lot of people don't know is that when she wrote her diary, she had never been in a concentration camp. The diary of Anne Frank has been translated into something like 65 languages. It exists not only in book form, but on the stage, in several film versions. There are postage stamps, there are ballets that have been written about her, and on and on and on. Anne Frank is the best known victim of the Holocaust. I've had a campaign going for 20 years, pleading with teachers to stop teaching Anne Frank's diary as a Holocaust text. If you've got a course on adolescent development, it's a wonderful book. But she knew nothing about the Holocaust. I um, mean, when this war is over, I'm gonna be a writer, she said. And one of the great unwritten works of the Holocaust is volume two of Anne Frank's diary, which she didn't live to write. That would have been a really important work for us, having gone through uh, Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, she now knew what it was all about, and she would have been able to tell us a lot of important things. If the Diary of Anne Frank is the only piece of Holocaust literature that a teacher is using, then I worry about the story that students are getting. I read books and I watched movies in order to try to understand what it is that my grandmother went through, but the one that really cracked it open for me was Mouse. And I think it's because of the medium that Mouse is presented in. It's a, it's a graphic novel, it's a language that my generation understands and can connect to. I mean, of course, it's 
comics rendering, it's an animal fable. There are many, many layers of mediation. But I think the two temporal levels are really important. So he has his father's story and he has the tape recorder in the drawings. He's, we see him recording the father's story. But whose story is it really? Well, it's his story. It's his story trying to understand the father's story. And it begins with a photograph. And the photograph is a very famous Margaret Bourke White photographs of survivors in Buchenwald behind the barbed wire. And Spiegelman uses that photograph as the first um, drawing. And in the very back, there's a face. And he has a little arrow that points to it. And it says, Papa. So what does that tell us? His father was not uh, in Buchenwald, so it's not a drawing of his father at all. But it is that the child who grows up in the 1950s in the United States cannot imagine his own father's story except by way of images that are public images that everyone has seen. His own relationship, familial relationship, to the story is already mediated by the public narratives that are available. And I think unless we realize that, that this, the history comes down to us multiply mediated through films and through um, historical accounts and through the Eichmann trial and through other kinds of uh, you know, big public events, we will not understand um, the complexity of this landscape. Mouse is a, is a graphic novel that has done more for my students than, and than I could imagine. What Mouse does so well is it takes such a complex topic like the Holocaust and uses iconic images to break it down into a level that my students understand. And not every artist is that successful. In fact, many artists take these iconic images and oversimplify the story of the Holocaust. And that's where things get dangerous because then students leave my classroom with this distorted, oversimplified view of something that was very complex. The Holocaust is being reduced to a name, a place, and a number. The name is Dr. Mengele, the place is Auschwitz, and the number is six million. And so the question in my mind is, how do you keep people, readers, audiences, conscious of the details of the Holocaust? I worry when it's three seconds, and then moves to the next thing. So you just read Diary of Anne Frank. Does anybody else feel, you know, oppressed in this way? Okay, now off to math class. When we work with, with educators, we want them to explore how memory is transmitted in a number of different ways through eyewitness testimonies, by bringing a survivor into the classroom, in person or at least on film, by reading memoirs. We've been working with a group called 3GNY, and it is the grandchildren of survivors who are being trained to tell their grandparents' stories. So what I would like to do is read a little short section from this book. And this book is from the voice of my grandfather. One day in 1945, word spread that the Americans were coming. The Germans were in a panic. They needed to hide evidence and decided to move all the Jews. About 6,000 prisoners were gathered from many camps, Jews, Russians, and homosexuals. I was 24 years old and had been in continuous forced labor for five years. We walked for an entire day, many dying along the way, falling to the ground from exhaustion or starvation or a beating or a German bullet. We finally arrived at another concentration camp and stepped through a metal gate under the sign Bergen Belsen. Well, I feel like I'm not coming in with an agenda. And even some of the questions that they asked me specifically about who um, rescued them, which countries came in, I really am not a history buff. And I don't, and I always try to defer to the teachers because. I, I, I'm not an expert on that. I mean, I know it's facts that I learned in school. I just want to come in and give them kind of a personal anecdote, tell them what well, my grandfather passed down to me. 
Um, in Harlem, I, I think I'm going to be speaking with eighth graders. You, I'm afraid, and yeah. I, in general, that I might say something to scare the kids. Do you have any other suggestions, you know, other questions to get them engaged if at first they're not so communicative? But we are only invited for about 40 minutes in, inside any given class. You can't teach history in 40 minutes. You can't teach your family story in 40 minutes. To be truly effective, we have to be able to give some kind of historical context. We have to be able to foster a very quick link so that they're not looking at you or me or any of us, like, who are these people? What are they talking about? I'm the grandchild of four Holocaust survivors, and it was always a, like a restlessness within me to try and figure out what to do with this legacy. But when I found Dan, we didn't do the normal New York, where are you from, where'd you go to college, what do you do? It was, my grandparents survived Auschwitz, your grandparents survived Majdanek, your grandparents were hidden. I had just never felt so uncomfortably comfortable in my life. Well, we, we bring the personal aspect to it. And when survivors pass on, that personal aspect um, will be lost, if not for us to step in. I had an idea about what was going on, but what she had said, how the kids were, were murdered, how they were pulled apart, I had no idea about that. It feels unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. The thing that got to me was that her grandfather was um, in a concentration camp because I didn't meet anyone that family has been um, in a concentration camp. Actually, knowing the person that their family went through this is more, um, you feel more sympathy. Even though I might not be Jewish, I know it happened to many people, and I don't feel okay for me to walk around and to not think about it because I wouldn't feel that I'm human and with feelings. I'm the grandchild of a Holocaust survivor. I've grown up listening to these stories, and I'm in this space where, where my grandmother's family died. So if I'm having difficulty with it, how realistic is it for children who read a chapter in a history book to understand it? There are a lot of challenges. Um, probably our first challenge is finding the time in the curriculum. There are times where when you're rushing through history and you're trying to get through the end of history and cover a certain number of years that you don't dedicate the time to certain events that really have shaped humanity. Engagement is another problem. Some of our students think that the Holocaust is something that happened hundreds of years ago. And as we lose survivors, and as we lose those eyewitness testimonies that seem to impact them the most, I would say bringing in a survivor or bringing in someone who liberated the camps is by far one of the best teaching tools I could ever use. But when we start to lose those people, the battle of replacing those people and how to replace those people. Do we replace it with video? Do we replace it with art? Do we replace it with text? Um, how is it best to represent those voices and those stories so that history is told accurately and the kids feel connected to the curriculum? This history that we teach here should be relevant to people's lives today. Uh, museums distinguish themselves by how they approach the history that they teach. In our museum, you'll hear the first person. Instead of Jews being objects that were acted upon, they are the subject of the story. When you're in the United States, you are looking at history through the liberator's viewpoint. How did America come into the war and what did Americans see? When you're in Yad Vashem, the narrative in Israel is in many ways a justification for the state of Israel. This is what we went through when we were not people who owned our own land, when we did not have the opportunity to form defenses. These Holocaust centers are not located at the authentic place where all this happened, whereas we as a memorial here are located at the place where this history has happened. Here, the victims are buried in mass graves. It's a starting point, and the, the exhibition is not a closure. It doesn't give you the full story. As an exhibition maker, you don't attempt to do that. You cannot expect that people will take the full story home. No, that's how history works. 
You cannot present the history as it is, interpreted forever. You can offer something where people have to work with. And I, at least, want every visitor to get away from me and saying, I don't know the full story. I have an impression, and now I have to work on it. Sometimes it happens that survivors come around and see things in the uh, display cases and say, well, I remember that, that's mine. Authentic sites have a certain weight to them. Walking around, seeing the enormity of the space, understanding the history of what happened here, and when a teacher spends time here, I think it changes the teacher. As we move past the generation of survivors, I, I don't think it's gonna get easier to understand this history. So we're gonna have to find other ways to transmit it, not really so much through cognitive uh, intellectual processes, but also perhaps through affect and emotion, through the arts, through poetry, through fiction, literature, and film. There is a gulf, a gap, a chasm between what they went through and me sitting here having gone through none of that. And I started reading fiction, sh novels, short stories, poetry, and so forth, drama, about the Holocaust. And I began to make a distinction. I said, of course I can't know it because they didn't go through it. But I can imagine it. And writers have done this all their lives. For example, hunger. In a short story by a survivor of Auschwitz named Tadeusz Borowski, he has two of his characters discussing hunger. And one of them says to the other, Tadek, do you want to know what real hunger is? Real hunger is when you look at another human being as something to eat. And when I read that, it just blew me away. And I said, historian couldn't say that. But in a short story, he can have a dialogue about that, which for me evoked the nature of extreme and total starvation. Art, I think, can transmit a much deeper layer of the human experience. A layer for which sometimes even words are not enough. At a certain level, when words are not enough, comes in the music. And sometimes when the music is not enough, comes the image. And then when the image is not enough, come the words, and it turns around and around and around. And I think art allows to communicate, art allows this kind of divine space, which is between one and another. What I'm trying to say is maybe, look, the things are not the way they, they seem on first sight. There is something that is basically broken and put together again. And maybe for me this breaking and putting back together in an incomplete form is the main subject of transmitting the memory of the Holocaust. We're speaking about ourselves and how we react to and feel about uh, the Holocaust. I think there is a place, an important place, for artists to do this. But at the same time, I'm very nervous about the idea of multiple truths because the next step from mythologizing is falsification and distortion. Uh, I feel it as a historian that my primary responsibility is to be as faithful as I can to what actually transpired. 
But I, I think, you know, it goes to a bigger question. From Schindler's List to Inglorious Bastards, like how do we tackle this in art? How do we tackle this in literature? How do we tackle it on television? These are giant questions. Because there's such a plethora now of productions about the Holocaust, it's real important to attend to what version of the Holocaust is being transmitted. And some of those versions hold closer to the historical truth some of them begin to move away from it, some sentimentalize it and romanticize it and make the Holocaust seem more accessible, but at the price of denuding it of its historical terror. Si vince a mille punti, il primo classificato vince un carro armato, vero? Ah, beh, beato lui. Ieri ha versucht il sabotage, wird mit dem sofortigen Tode bestraft. Die Hinrichtungen finden auf dem Hof durch Schüsse in den Rücken statt. Ogni giorno vi daremo la classifica generale da quella tua parlante là. All'ultimo classificato verrà attaccato con un cartello con su scritto Asino, qui sulla schiena. One of the films, for example, that was very controversial just in that realm is Life is Beautiful, right? It's historically inaccurate, it's funny, you know, it tells a, a feel good story. Io schiena! Teufel machst du? Vorwärts! Schiena! And it doesn't have to be absolutely factually accurate. I think there are many kinds of truths. Uh, and the truth is not, it's not only factual. We can have an emotional kind of truth. So even a film like uh, Life is Beautiful can tell you something about the fantasies of someone who might have been in the camps more than perhaps the reality of their experiences. But those fantasies are also worth thinking about or reading about. I have my real problems with Life is Beautiful, the whole idea we don't even need to go there, but um, would I rather that movie be made than not made? Absolutely. But, you know, there's a certain sensitivity, a certain, um, well, if it's going to be diluted into a joke, well, who's going to take it actually seriously? My main job is to make people laugh. Of course, you know, th there are ulterior motives. I'd you get on a, a soapbox with Hitler, he's going to win. He's a great orator. But if you, can, if you can ridicule him, if you can ridicule Hitler, if you can bring him down with, with laughter, <laughs> then you're going you're gonna to win that struggle. But I mean, but this is the thing, is Hollywood tells a story. Their whole reason for being is to is for drama and to tell a story. The problem is when people look at those movies and take it as truth and not as a reinterpretation of what happened or a dramatization of what happened. I remember being in grade 11 and we each for history class we each had to take a different section of history and I remember a group did um, did World War II. That was what they wanted to do. And it was a joke. They had like Nazi symbols on and they were hailing Hitler and, you know, they made this movie or whatever and they were like laughing during it and it was just a joke to them. And I remember getting up and leaving. And I was just like, how can you laugh at this? But they don't understand it. So I went back to the class you know, and the teacher starting a discussion on World War II, and I put my hand up and I was like, I, no, I need to tell you this. This is what happened. You're making a joke of it. That's offensive to me. Beginning at Hebrew school, probably fourth grade, I saw the first ever Holocaust documentary that I knew about. 
and it was shocking. I didn't, I had no idea I was a nine-year-old boy. It was very, very uncomfortable. You know, when we went to the concentration camps, even at 20 years old when I was there, I, I didn't comprehend it. I couldn't comprehend the enormity of it. When you see the bunkers and you see the, the crematorium and, you know, could you imagine what it was like as a, as a killing machine? I can't imagine those 12 or 13 year old kids from Germany understanding it either. So one of the important things in order to keep our generation engaged in Holocaust remembrance and education is to basically universalize it and, and take those lessons and apply them to other human rights issues, whether it's Darfur, whether it was the Bosnia conflict or anywhere else that we see kind of these human rights tragedies and, and genocides. You know what, we have a couple of clubs that... I don't think that you could take something like Rwanda and say, well, Rwanda and the Holocaust are the same. But I think there are parallels. And I think pointing out these parallels and allowing kids to see that the hate and, and all of the things that led up to the, the death of millions of people, um, there are components and pieces of those that still hold true around the world today. This is still relevant. This isn't over. We haven't stopped hurting people because of, of race or religion or culture. It continues. I really didn't understand what had happened in the Holocaust until I started opening my eyes to what was going on today. I grew up in Portland, Maine. Portland, Maine has over 100 families directly from Darfur, Sudan. When I joined the human rights movement in high school, I started to work with them directly. So I was simultaneously learning about current unfolding genocides as I was looking backwards to the Holocaust. It's an ongoing dance to get the balance between the unique and the universal. There are Holocaust scholars who feel very strongly that the Holocaust is a unique event. It should not be discussed in the context of any other event. And then there are others who say there's so much that happened during this time. We have to talk about the Holocaust in connection with everything else. A number of universities which originally housed Holocaust study centers have broadened the mission of those centers. They're now called Holocaust and Genocide Studies Centers or Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Studies Centers. So the idea is broaden out, universalize, get away from Jewish particularism. There seems to be a need to find a value at the core of the Holocaust as an experience. Otherwise, what's the point of studying it? As if mere consciousness of its reality is not sufficient. As far as I'm concerned, that is sufficient. How do the survivors feel when they come back to Bergen-Belsen knowing that um, it, it's the German people who are continuing this? Here in Germany, when you were at such a place um, and are, so are a bit familiar with Jewish history, it's clear for our visitors he must be a Jew, otherwise he would not work there and would not be familiar with Jewish history. Today we give more than 1,000 guided tours for, for school classes here, which more than 50% of the pupils did not originate from Germany. Often their spontaneous reaction is, I have nothing to do with it. I am originate from Turkey, I'm neither German nor Jewish. The Jews and the Germans, that's, that's something for the Jews and the Germans. They have to deal both, both with it. And we try to convince such pupils that this has also something to do with him. There are people who just don't want to hear about the Holocaust and don't want, and to those people I say, uh, you know, it's your prerogative, fine. Uh, but if you want to understand the nature of the world we've been living in for the last hundred years, you cannot ignore the Holocaust. It's important to realize that memory is no longer enough. It's very easy to look backwards and say, that right there, well, that will never happen again. The Holocaust will never happen again. These phrases are a dime a dozen from politicians who are actively supporting deadly conflicts around the world. We live in a very unsecure world. We want to inherit to our children and the legacy of taking care that something like this doesn't happen again. But in order for them to 
make the world better. They have to know what happened. If you don't know what happened, how can you prevent it? There is absolutely no value in having Holocaust remembrance become the unique property of survivors, their children, their grandchildren, and so forth. This is part of the inheritance of humankind as a whole. I'm an African-American Southerner. I'm a Catholic. <laughs> I was born in the 1960s. You know, this is not my history. So why would I ever be attracted to this history? Because it comes back down to this notion of the human behavior. We are capable of great evil and we're capable of great goodness and grace. That's what drew me. And ultimately, it's my history because it's human history and it continues to resonate. I'm still processing the enormity of it, but I'm starting to understand my grandmother's story and, and I don't think I could have if I hadn't come to Bergen-Belsen. Seeing Masha's grave and the hospital and my mom's birth certificate, the story is still surreal, but I have these details now that I can hold on to. And it's these details that I can pass on to my family. As time goes by, goes by. the details are forgotten. And that memory gets fuzzier. <laughs>